can I ask everyone to mute, uh, please? Um, good morning. Uh, welcome to the webinar series uh, of British Indian Orthopedic Society. Uh, this is our fifth webinar. Uh, all these webinars uh, so far have covered different subspecialties and have been very successful. We've got three eminent foot and ankle surgeons who will be sharing your experience uh, with you. Just a couple of things about the housekeeping. Um, please stay muted. If you have any questions, please put it on the uh, chat uh, function and we'll pick up the questions and we'll do the discussion towards the end. So we'll go with the three talks, uh, the calcaneal fractures followed by Taylor's fractures, followed by Lisfranc fractures, and then we'll do 15 minute discussion with the faculty in the end. Uh, there is also in the chat function, there is a link for feedback. So please uh, fill in the feedback, it's uh, simple, uh, but uh, as soon as you've done the feedback, you'll, it will generate a certificate for you. So don't forget to do it. And also, if you're not a member of British Indian Orthopedic Society, I would strongly encourage you to join us. Um, uh, and there will be a link for the membership as well. So without uh, spending any more time, I would uh, welcome our first speaker, Mr. Mahadevan, who is a, a foot and ankle surgeon at Reading and he's going to talk about calcaneal fractures. Over to you, Dev. Thanks, Manish. Um, and, and thanks again once for, uh, for, the, for the invitation to do this um, webinar with you guys. So I'm Dev Mahadev and based in Reading. Foot and ankle practice is uh, all I do. And we're gonna talk about calcaneal fractures today. So in terms of um, the objectives of this talk, I'm going to briefly describe the epidemiology, the mechanisms of uh, injury, how we assess these uh, fractures, a brief overview of classifications that I feel are useful, uh, treatment strategy, and um, complications from calcaneal fractures. So, the mechanism. Now, invariably, the vast majority of these patients are young patients, 90% are in the age of 20 to 45, and they're mainly industrial, falling from heights, etc., and usually young men. And the mechanism is for intra-articular fractures, which is what we are talking about today mainly, it's a axial load, and that's the lateral tailor process literally wedging into the sinus tarsi, causing fractures through the calcaneus. Now, depending on the uh, severity of the force and any rotational alignments uh, through it, the fracture patterns are different. So fall from height is a classical example. Road traffic collisions where um, the brake pedal or accelerator pedal hits on the plantar side with force leading to these fractures. And as we discussed earlier, you end up with different fracture patterns depending on the force applied. So twisting injuries is another way of fracturing calcaneal fra uh, calcaneus, but um, it tends to lead to extra articular fractures mainly, such as the anterior process of the calcaneus and occasionally the calcaneal tuberosity. So assessments, I mean, patients would usually come in with heel pain invariably, and uh, don't be surprised that you will see bruising, blistering very soon after these injuries because they, they can blister within three hours of the impact. Now, do not forget associated injuries. About 10% of these patients may have a concomitant tibial plateau, uh, lumbar spine, or even bilateral calcaneal fractures. So worth looking into this and worth imaging these parts if there's any suspicion of that. So what would you expect to see? Well, if the fractures are displaced enough, the heel can be widened. You will see that the heel may be shortened. There'll be bruising, blistering, and open wounds is something you need to look for. And this is most commonly seen on the medial side. And the other thing to note is that some of these fractures will put the skin at risk. So if you have a calcaneal tuberosity fracture or a tongue type fracture, you may end up with puncture marks or potential uh, open wounds where the fracture is literally sitting under the skin. So if you see these, these are what I call potential uh, skin breakdown leading to uh, future problems if not dealt with acutely. So if you suspect the calcaneal fractures, go for some imaging. Um, the most uh, frequently used are x-rays because they're very useful. And I find a series of x-rays helps you um, uh, dissect the fracture lines and, and plan your surgery. 
So the, the one on the bottom left here is the lateral view, which is like the workhorse uh, x-ray. And you can you know, do your lines, such as the one I've um, shown above, which is the bowler's angle and angle of Gizane. And basically, you can see the three points here, the posterior tuberosity, uh, the posterior facet, and the anterior process, literally giving you a flat bowler's angle. If you look at the axial view, which is also described as the Harris view, this is where you see calcaneal shortening, the widening of the heel, and looking for the varus alignment of the tuberosity, because invariably most of these fractures lead to a varus malalignment. So AP ankle, another useful thing, and the reason why I like those views is that if you do have a lateral blowout fracture, like this fragment here, it gives you a nice view of where you would expect the heel to be if this is managed non-operatively. And this is likely to lead to subfibular impingement, which we'll discuss, uh, discuss later. Broden's view, which is what you see on the right here, is I think more useful during surgery. It helps you restore the articular, uh, uh, articular surface of the posterior facet. Um, invariably, all of my patients get a CT scan, and I think it's useful for um, planning surgery, but also um, in deciding whether surgery is appropriate for these patients or not. And it gives you a better 3D view uh, than an X-ray. So classifications, I feel they're just two useful ones uh, to remember. You have the traditional SX Lepresti fracture classification, and you have the Sanders classification. The SX Lepresti is a X-ray guided, uh, sorry, X-ray based uh, classification. And literally, it's quite straightforward. You've got a primary fracture line, and that happens in all calcaneal fractures. And the primary calcaneal fracture line leads to two main fragments, one which is the anteromedial, and the second being the posterolateral. So that's that red line there on a lateral view. Now, the secondary fracture line are these green ones and blue ones. So if the secondary fracture line exits the superior cortex of the calcaneus, that leaves you with a separate joint fragment, and that's called a joint depression type SX Lopresti classification. If the secondary fracture line exits the calcaneal tuberosity, and this leads to the classical tongue type fracture, both are intraarticular fractures, but they just exit at a different point in the calcaneus. The Sanders classification is a CT based one, and uh, again, very useful uh, for preoperative uh, planning and it looks at the widest part of the posterior facet. So uh, what the Sanders classification did was to divide the posterior facet into three areas, A, B, and C, and then you're lo literally looking at how many parts of the posterior, or how many fragments of fractures you see and where the fracture lines exit. So for example, here, you've got a two-part fracture and the fracture line exits zone A, so it's a 2A. Down here, you've got three fracture fragments, with fracture lines exiting zone B and zone C, so it's a 3BC. Anything more than three fragments uh, or classification. So treatment, to fix or not to fix, it's still uncertain. There's still lots of trials out there and there's still a lot of uncertainty uh, as to how we've managed them best. So enthusiastic surgeons would probably recommend surgery because they uh, feel that they can improve function and reduce morbidity. Um, others may consider that surgery is complex, expensive, risky, and of uncertain benefits. The way I look at it is I think you've got to make these decisions based on, on individual patient and fracture characteristics, uh, what you are able to do and what the science is. Uh, and I should use this combination of, uh, of all these factors in order to make an informed decision for the patient. So let's talk about some evidence. And I think these four papers are, papers are quite useful for exams. Um, the first one is Sanders in 1993, looked at his series of 120 fractures. And literally what he said was, if you have stage, uh, oh sorry, classification two and three, you generally do well. Uh, type four fractures do poorly. And that's even with um, years of practice, increasing surgical experience, type fours do poorly, even after four years. Uh, Buckley in 2002 uh, looked at an RCT and he found no difference between surgery or conservative treatment. However, um, if you do a subgroup analysis, certain patients did better from surgery, and those include patients not receiving workers' compensation, 
females, younger patients uh, under the age of 29. Uh, then per Agron in 2013 performed an RCT, similarly showed no difference at one year, whether you had surgery or not, but there was a difference uh, or some benefit at least eight to 12 years post-operatively. So um, finally, the UK HEAL trial, which is quoted a lot, and that was the paper from Coventry, and their conclusion was there wasn't any um, advantage at two years, whether these fractures were managed conservatively or through surgery, but there was a higher complication rate. But I think the take home message with this paper though, is that grossly deformed fractures were excluded. So uh, anyone with severe hind foot deformity, such as fibular impingement and calcaneal varus were not part of this trial. So what is the initial management for these patients? It's all about the soft tissues. So that's the take home message. It's all about looking after the soft tissues before you, you, you deal any uh, further trauma to it. So if the skin is under threat, and this is class classically seen in the tongue type fractures or tuberosity fractures, these need urgent intervention. Uh, you should try to see whether you can at least attempt a close reduction in position in quinus to literally take the pressure off the skin. Um, but if not successful, then, then you should attempt to do an urgent reduction and fixation before it, you convert this to an open fracture. Now, obviously, there's no immediate uh, skin compromise. All you need to do is rest it, keep it elevated, ice it, because you really want to reduce the soft tissue swelling and diminish any chance of fracture blisters in case you're planning surgical intervention. So for me, non-operative treatments, I would consider this for minimally uh, or moderately displaced fractures. Um, when the soft tissues are poor, so uh, this picture here on the right is someone, you know, two to three weeks later, and the blisters are still really bad. And the way I look at it is, you know, it's the lesser of two evils is to allow the fracture to heal and deal with any problems later on. Someone with peripheral vascular disease, poorly controlled diabetics, elderly patients, I'll probably err towards non-operative treatment. So uh, in my practice, the first 24, 48 hours, you tend to, I tend to elevate the foot, uh, ice it. And then I put them into a boot, not necessarily to protect the fracture, but more to help with the soft tissue settling down and to prevent any equinus contracture because of the swelling and, and pain. I would usually non-weight bear them for about eight to 10 weeks. And then they start protected weight bearing after, range of movement exercises start early. I will have to accept that some of these may have secondary surgery later on, and it may be challenging because of the deformity. What about operative treatment? Again, in packing order, if you have an open if you have an open if you have an open fracture or the uh, skin is at risk, when you have significant joint subluxation or dislocation, like on the CT scan here, I would err towards surgery. Now. A fracture displacement of two millimeters on isolation, I may not intervene, but in combination with the others, I, I'm likely to, to intervene at that stage. So the main objective of surgery is to restore the heel shape, correct the varus, narrow down the heel again, gain the height, relocate any displaced joints, and try and restore the articular surface as well as possible. And you, you, you do that with the view of having uh, to try and reduce morbidity going forwards. So what are the classical uh, approaches to dealing with this is the extended lateral approach, which was uh, popularized by Zwip and Atkinson, which is a long extended lateral, a big L-shaped incision. It's very useful. It's a, it gives you a great view of the calcaneus, uh, but it can potentially cause soft tissue problems. And therefore, you need to be very careful, especially in this corner, about how you handle the soft tissues. You also have the sinus tarsi approach, which I, tends to be my work uh, horse nowadays, which is a, a great way of looking at the joints, reduce your articular surfaces, but it may not give you the exposure of the tuberosity fragment. And then you've got the percutaneous ways of dealing with it, MIS, arthroscopically assisted. Now, all of them respect the soft tissues much more, but they limit the potential exposure you get and potential correction from surgery. But you know, there is a place for this definitely, and it's certainly uh, sometimes a compromise type operation that we do when the soft tissues are poor. Complications, uh, overall, if surgery uh, is considered, remember the soft tissues, soft tissue necrosis and infection, 
uh, is a known risk factor, so respect the soft tissues at all times. Post-traumatic arthritis is invariable in these patients. Mm -hmm. And malunion, and, and that's when these patients may be left with a widened heel, lateral wall displacement, and this can lead to shoe fitting problems in the future, irritation in the subfibular region, peroneal tendon irritation. And patients with a varus malunion can have lateral foot overload leading to callosity, stress fractures, and also attrition of the, of the soft tissues laterally. So um, these are potential complications from not intervening surgically, but also at times these fractures can be that challenging that even with surgery, you are still left with some amount of malunion. So to summarize, these injuries are very significant. A paper in 1916 uh, stated, ordinarily speaking, the, main who, the man who breaks his heel bone is done so far as his industrial future is concerned. And that is quite true. And I think it's very important to tell these patients that you know, these are career changing and you may have to think about what you're doing in the future. My management strategy is always about damage limitation and reducing potential mobility in the future. Uh, whilst considering the soft tissues and uh, balancing that against um, potential malunion and long-term consequences. And as mentioned earlier, patients should be counseled accordingly. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Dev. Uh, can I request everybody to please keep uh, muted so that uh, uh, you know, the speakers are not interrupted? Thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk, Dev. You have covered it beautifully, summarized it all very well, and uh, it, it, it is uh, straightforward. Uh, we will take the questions towards the end. So if you can unshare your screen, please. If you, that's, that's great. Thank you so much, Dev. Uh, I am now going to invite our next speaker, uh, Mr. Kakwani. Mr. Kakwani is a very good uh, colleague, friend, uh, foot and ankle surgeon based in Northumbria, and he's going to take us through uh, the complex talus fractures. Over to you, Rajesh. Hi. Uh, thanks, Manish, and thanks to BIOS for allowing me uh, and inviting me to talk on talus fractures. Um, I'll try to dedicate the talk and uh, direct the talk towards two categories. One is general orthopedic surgeons and two tra trainees who are going to appear for the exam. Um, and so we'll start with this difficult, but fortunately very rare injury. Now I come from Northumbria, which is in the Northeast of England. Uh, the talk today is about a few topics like what is unique about talus, how are talus fractures presented, uh, what type of imaging that you can use for talus fractures, a bit about classification, management, initial as well as definitive, and what are their outcomes. Now, what's so unique about talus? Talus has no bone, uh, no tendons or ligaments attached to it. 60% of the surface of talus has articular cartilage covering it. It has very poor vascularity. All the blood vessels are perforating vessels which enter the bone on its surface to give vascularity to the talus. It is generally a very stable bone, and, but it has a lot of articulations. Ah. Now, if there are two slides that you can take away from this talk, this is one of them. Because if you're going for the exam and you get a talus fracture <laughs> case, this is definitely going to be asked. Now, the talus vascularity comes from three main blood vessels, the anterior tibial artery, posterior tibial artery, and the perforating branch of the peroneal artery. As you can see, the, talus, uh, the blood supply to the body of the talus comes from either the talus sling, which is formed by the artery of the uh, tarsal sinus and the tarsal canal, and goes upwards and there is supply from the posterior aspect through the deltoid branch of the uh, posterior tibial artery and laterally through a branch of the peroneal artery. The head of the talus is predominantly supplied by the dorsalis pedis artery and branches from that talus sling inferiorly. Now,
Rajesh, we have lost you. I can't. Is that an IT glitch? Back with you. Sorry. Rajesh, yeah, we lost you. Yeah. Can you, share you it again? Are, can you see me now again? We can see you. Can you just go back? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll start with this again. Sorry for the IT glitch. No problem. Uh, Don't worry. You can go back to the vascularity, please. We, we lost you from okay. there. Yeah. So yes. the vascularity of the talus is extremely, extremely important. And this is one of the most important slides that you should take away from this talk. Uh, all the arteries are perforating arteries which enter the bone of the talus and supply it. It has no muscle or tendon insertion which would give it blood supply. So the main blood supply is from the posterior tibial artery, the dorsalis pedis artery, and the perforating branch of the peroneal artery. The main supply to the body part is from the tarsal sling, which is a combination of the artery of the tarsal sinus and the tars artery of the tarsal canal, coming medial and lateral respectively. There are also branches posteriorly, which form an anastomosis around the posterior process of the talus, from the calcaneal branch of the posterior tibial artery and then laterally from the peroneal artery. So this is a very common question and you should try and draw this and practice this diagram for your exams. Now for uh, the fracture types, the commonest ones are the tailor neck fracture. You can also get tailor body and tailor head fractures, but you should not miss the peripheral fractures of the talus, i.e the fractures of the posterior, i.e. medial and lateral posterior processes of the talus or the lateral process. You can also get questions about osteochondral uh, fractures of the talar dome. Now, about the process fractures, whether it's lateral, medial process fractures, generally what you would need to do is have a CT scan to ascertain whether these fractures are comminuted, the size of the fragments. If they are big enough, then there is an option of fixing them with interfragmentary compression. But if they are as small, then there is an option of excising them or treating them conservatively and then excising them if they are symptomatic. Now, regarding the main meat of this talk, which is the Taylor neck fractures, these, as Dave also mentioned, are associated with a very significant soft tissue injuries. 30% of them are open. They can have a phenomenal internal degloving Loving. and they are prone yeah. to have compartment syndrome. It is extremely important to identify these urgently and treat them urgently on most cases. Otherwise, the whole skin can necrose and lead to a effectively open fracture. Now, the other thing that you need to know, especially for the exam, is this specific view described by Canal which gives you a very nice profile view of the tailor neck. This is especially important during intraoperative reductions to know to avoid any varus or valgus malunion. So as described, this is a special technique to see the tailor neck in profile. Now, you would obviously use pre-op CT scan, which would help you define where the fragments are, the comminution, it will help you decide which approach you're going to take and your method of fixation. Now, the second slide, which is possibly the only two slides that you need to take away, is this classification. That is Hawkins classification. You would almost invariably be asked about it, where type 1 is an undisplaced neck fracture, type 2 is a fracture of the tailor neck with subtalar sub displacement. Type three is subtalar and tibio tailor uh, subluxation. And type four, which was added by canal, also includes the na uh, navicular, telonavicular joint being dislocated. Obviously, as the intensity or the classification progresses towards four, the avascular necrosis rate goes on increasing. This has been debated, but still most of your examiners would consider these figures to be known. Now, how does this affect? As we discussed, the vascularity of the talus is very, very precarious. Imagine when these joints get dislocated or the talus moves away from the subtalar and the tibiotalar joints. 
all those tenuous blood supply vessels would get disrupted and you would get avascularity of the tailored dome. That's, so the severity of the injury would dis, decide how much vascularity would be compromised after a tailor fracture. Now, the management, as in all foot and ankle fractures and would be repeated again and again during these talks, is management of the soft tissues. We should try and restore the vascularity of the, the talus as quickly as possible. In most cases, you may have to span it and scan it and then plan your surgery. Now, it is important to take the pressure off from the skin, especially if the talus, uh, tailor dome is out of the tibio-tailor joint. It is important to reduce additional vascular insult by your approaches. It is important to restore the anatomically uh, as far as possible to enhance vascularity and reduce the risk of AVM. Now, which approaches can we use for the talus, tailor neck fractures? The commonest one used is the anterolateral approach, which is from the anterior aspect of the lateral malleolus to the fifth, third metatarsal. It is relatively internervous plane, and we try to uh, use windows between those blood supply of the talus to approach the lateral aspect of the tailor neck. It gives you good views to reduce the tailor neck fracture. It can be used in isolation or in combination. Sometimes you need to have extra access. I generally tend to release the ATFL rather doing a fibular osteotomy like this. But if you need to do a lateral malleolar osteotomy, you should pre-drill it and uh, then do the osteotomy and fix it back. The medial approach is between the tib ant and the tip post, which is the traditional approach that you would have used for telonavicular fusions. It again um, uh, reduces the risk of additional vascular insult to the talus and is in, in a relatively avascular area. The medial approach can be augmented by doing a medial malleolar osteotomy. I tend to use these approach mainly when we have an intra-articular tailor body fracture, which needs to be reviewed uh, anatomically as uh, reduced and fixed. Uh, important thing is between the superficial and deep deltoid ligament runs that deltoid branches of the tailor blood supply. It is important to be aware of that and not compromise that. The advantages and disadvantages of medial approach is the advantage is that you can assess the tibial com uh, the tailor comminution medially, which is common site. There is dorsal and medial comminution associated with tailor fractures usually. You can reduce it anatomically, but the disadvantage is fixing it from there. If you are very, very dorsal in your articular uh, anterior to posterior screws, then you may, in theory, distract the fracture site on the plantar aspect. You do additional stripping of the blood supply. And if you're using a collateral approach, i.e. anterolateral combined with medial approach, then beware of that skin bridge between those two approaches. Keep as much skin bridge as possible to avoid that bridge from necrosing. The other trick is that if you can get a slightly plantar intra-articular headless compression screw through the tailor head, then you reduce that risk that I described a couple of minutes ago. The posterior lateral approach is used mainly for fixing the fibula, uh, fixing the talus rather than reducing it. You cannot see the reduction through this approach. This part of the approach is the vertical limb of the extended lateral approach. The structures obviously to be aware of is the sural nerve and you have to approach it between the flexalysis longus and the peroneus brevis tendon. If, if you're using this approach to fix the uh, tailor neck fracture, it is important to approach it laterally, start the screws laterally, just distill to the articular surface. And when you're doing that, you should remember that you have to point the screws plantar 24 degrees and medial 24 degrees due to the peculiar anatomy of the talus. Now, in summary about the surgical approaches, you get fantastic reduction through the anteromedial approach and then anterolateral. Comparatively, you, the fixation may not be as stable with these approaches, uh, but the posterior approach gives you fantastic fixation and does not compromise the vascularity, but doesn't allow you to reduce it anatomically. 
Now, going through an example, this is an example of a patient where I was called by one of my panicking colleague with this tailor neck fracture where the tailor body had subluxed posteriorly. Now, how would I approach this? First of all, we need to reduce that tailor body back into the tailor, uh, tibio tailor joint. You may wish to put a Steinman pin through the calcaneum to give traction. You would rarely ever succeed in doing these closed in the A&E. So I would encourage you to get them to theater as soon as possible because that tailor body would compromise on the blood supply and the skin overlying it. Now, I use, generally I use put K wires into the tailor body and the tailor head fragment as joysticks to be able to manipulate those fractures, fragments into reduction. And then percutaneously either pass K wires or guide wires of the screws that I'm going to use for definitive fixation. Now, if there is comminution laterally, as in this case, I use the lateral plate to bridge that comminution and a medial screw to cause com compression across the fracture side. Now, this is the, uh, the, these were the canal views and the AP lateral views of the ankle to make sure that there is no malunion. The commonest malunions are in dorsiflexion and in varus. These are the fixation devices. On the lateral side, I've put a bridging plate across it and on the medial side, an intraarticular headless compression screw, which has been buried below the articular surface. Now that's how the plate was put on and that was the position of the screw. Now post-operatively, you would keep them non-weight bearing for at least six weeks. What you need to know for your exam purposes is that Hawkins sign. That is that radial lucency that appears due to the prolonged immobilization at around six to eight weeks after the fracture. That is a good sign. That means your tailor body has vascularity. That's why it has been involved in that uh, the disuse atrophy or disuse osteoporosis. Now outcomes. Avascular necrosis is common in most series. Most of them require, uh, some of them require open reduction in internal fixation. There's a high incidence of non-union and malunion in these cases and secondary osteoarthritis. So it is extremely important to counsel the patient uh, that this is a life changing or at least a career changing injury and that long-term implications are possible because if the patient is aware before you do the operative intervention, then it is generally not considered as your own complication. So the learning points or taking away points, it's a high energy injury. It has a high incidence of soft tissue and vascular compromise. It is often comminuted, especially on the medial side. It should be reduced anatomically and fixed and to reduce additional vascular insult, iatrogenic. And it is important to counsel the patient regarding the risk of avascular necrosis and osteoarthritis. Thank you. That's great. Very, very enlightening talk, Rajesh. Uh, beautiful pictures, illustrations, and an excellent uh, case which you shared with us. Um, there is a lot of um, questions and chat coming up, which we'll discuss towards the end. Um, I would now like to invite our final speaker for today, uh, Mr. Nilesh Makwana, who is a, uh, a colleague, a senior colleague in Oswestry. Uh, who is going to share his experience with us about Lisfranc fractures. Uh, Nilesh, can you start sharing your screen with us, please? Whilst Sorry. Nilesh is doing there, yes, sorry, can yeah, we can that? see. Yes, we can. Okay. Thank Over you very you. much, Nilesh. Thank you to BIOS, everyone. Um, my talks on Lisfranc injuries. The theme remains the same. These are high energy injuries occasionally, and soft tissue is um, very, very important. So. So the aim of this um, talk, we will discuss the anatomy, the mechanism of injury, patterns of injury, what are the treatment options, what are the complications and controversies uh, treating these uh, fractures. So you all know um, Liz Frank, Jack Liz Frank, he was a, um, a gynecologist and colorectal surgeon. Um, he was um, a field surgeon in the Napoleon, Napoleonic Army and he described um, amputation through the Lisfranc joint, um, hence the name in cavalrymen. 
he also uh, was quite unique. He could diagnose fractures using a stethoscope. So that's um, Mr. Liz Frank. So th these, these are the kind of injuries we're talking about. We're talking about Liz Frank injuries of the midfoot, the tarsal, metatarsal joint, uh, cuneiform area. So first of all, these are rare. They account for 0.2% of uh, fractures. Um, the anatomy is complex. There's controversies in how you uh, treat these fractures, especially if you've got sprains in athletic uh, personnel. More than 30% uh, are delayed, and there's a high litigation element to this, hence uh, the importance of treating these accurately. So a bit about anatomy. The Lisfranc um, joints have ligaments on the dorsum, um, on the intermetatarsal area, and also on the plantar aspect. On the dorsum, the ligaments are very thin, ribbon-like. On the plantar aspect, they're very thick. You've got um, thick ligaments from the cuneiform to the first metatarsal, medial cuneiform to the second, third, and then all, all the way across the other lesser metatarsals. In the intermetatarsal area, the most important ligament is the Lisfranc ligament. And that goes from the medial cuneiform to the second metatarsal there. Now, in some people, it can be two bundles, in others, it's just a single bundle, but that's very important. And the other important bit to note is there's no intermetatarsal ligament between the first and second. Second, third, third, fourth, fourth and fifth do have intermetatarsal ligaments. And this is a uh, illustration of the Lisfranc ligament. You can see it on um, MRI scans, T1 and T2 images there. The other important element is a bony uh, architecture. So the uh, metatarsal bases and the cuneiform form a, what, what we call a Roman arch and the second metatarsal is the keystone. Damage the keystone and the integrity of the arch is compromised. Another classification uh, or theory is a columnar theory by uh, Myerson and Kyoda from uh, Baltimore um, the column theory is the medial column is your first ray, cuneiform and navicular, your middle column, second and third metatarsal, middle and lateral cuneiform, and your lateral column, uh, which is your more flexible column, fourth and fifth metatarsal and cuboid. So the important learning point here is the anatomy is complex. Think about the columns. Note that the ligaments on dorsum are weak. And the Lisfranc, uh, Lisfranc ligament is very important. So how do most people get these injuries? Well, you can have high, high energy injuries or high energy athletic type sport injury, where you can get an field type injury. You can have high energy crush injuries. So note the significant um, uh, damage to the soft tissue on the plantar aspect. Or what we typically see is the low energy twisting, torsion type injury. Elderly lady stepping off a stool, hanging up a curtain, and she complains of pain in the midfoot. So the important bit here is you can have direct and indirect injuries. You can have multiple forces going through the foot and no one really knows the exact mechanism because it's quite complex, but soft tissue injury, the crush injury is, is very important to be aware of. So when you, um, when you look at these patients and making your uh, diagnosis, you've got to take a good history about the mechanism, find out where the pain is. And often patients say, I've slipped off, I've got pain in the middle of the foot, it's swelling. Uh, when you examine them, they're swelling there, they're tender in the midfoot, they can't go on tiptoes, especially the single limb stance. You do ask them to go step on tiptoes on one leg and they, they struggle. Also, if, if they have plantar bruising, plantar ecchymosis, this is almost pathognomonic of a list rank injury, so a very high index of suspicion. So as I said before, th these, are, these can be subtle injuries. Uh, between 20 and 39% are missed. So look very carefully uh, when, at the gap between the first and second metatarsal. Look for the flex side, we'll come on to that in a moment. So be very suspicious and have a very high index. Normally you would see trauma x-rays where the patient's on the bed and you've got AP and lateral 
but if possible, try and uh, get standing x-rays once the pain and swelling is settled. Um, on the AP view, you're looking at the first and second metatarsal. On the 30 degree oblique view, you're looking at the lateral three um, rays. And on the lateral view, you're looking at alignment of the TMT joints in the sagittal plane. So what do you look for on your plane x-rays? Try and match up first and second TMT joint. Look at the gap between the first and second uh, metatarsal and cuneiform. Match up the um, medial aspect of the medial, middle cuneiform and second metatarsal. And the gap between second and third. On the oblique view, match up the uh, cuboid and fourth metatarsal. And on the lateral view, match up the TMT joint here. You can see the second metatarsal is depressed there. So if you look at these carefully, then you'll often pick these lesions up quite easily. So the flex sign, if you look carefully, sometimes you see a tiny fragment between the first and second metatarsal. That's an avulsion of Lis Frank ligament and can come off the second metatarsal or the cuneiform. Somebody's writing on my PowerPoint presentation. I don't know if you're seeing that as well. Yes, I can see that as well, Nire. <laughs> oh, I don't know who's doing that, but it's not me. Someone's got the executive powers, sorry. So uh, don't forget the cuboid. So in some of these injuries, you'll see a significant crush injury to the cuboid. And if the lateral column length is shortened, that can lead to significant uh, deformity, which you've got to uh, look and address. Um, Imaging wise, again, standing views are very important. If you're not sure, get comparative views, both feet standing AP and compare the gap between the first and second metatarsal. Again, if you're not sure, then you may undergo stress views in theater. So you stress the midfoot joints in all three planes, AP translation, varus valgus, and also rotatory. So um, you, you look at the uh, TMT joints in three dimensions, uh, ultrasound scan is also becoming used more frequently now with uh, the user operator expertise increasing. You can actually pick up subtle uh, injuries as well. So here's a stress test. You can see before and after the displacement uh, between the first second metatarsal, also the incongruency of the first TMT joint. This is a young girl referred to me, stepped in a pothole, presented to A&E, with midfoot pain, it was swollen. Six weeks later, these are the x-rays and you can see the diastasis there, small fleck fragment as well. So this was a missed Liz Frank injury. Again, if you're not sure, your next modality will be a CT or MRI. CT is very good for bony anatomy. There's a high number of patients who have uh, metatarsal fractures or associated fractures, such as uh, talus or uh, ankle or calcaneum. So worth looking out for. MRI scan is good for looking at the ligamentous injury, uh, but not very good for anatomy bone-wise. Classification, I won't dwell on this too much. Um, Kenu and Kuss first proposed a classification which is then modified by Hardcastle and then subsequently by Myerson. Um, none of them give you prognostic um, features um, and none of them address the ligamentums. Uh, side. But if we look at the Keno and Cus, and that's, this is a hard castle. So essentially you've got types A, B and C. So type A, we have total incongruity where the whole forefoot is translated laterally or in an AP direction. Type B is partial incong incongruity, either the medium uh, side, the first metatarsal displaces medially and the rest stay in the same place, or the lateral uh, side of the foot displaces and the first ray stays in the same place, or you get type C divergent. Usually it's a complex combination of these. So questions you need to ask, is this a stable or an unstable injury? Is it purely ligamentous or is it purely bone or is it both? 
So you do need to scan these. You may need to do stress views. You have to take into consideration the skin and soft tissue. And then you need to decide when and how to fix these. So your principal objectives, you must get a stable plant degrade, anatomically reduced uh, foot, and this will likely give you the best outcome. This is a key paper from Mark Myerson from Baltimore, uh, quite a long time ago, and it clearly shows if you've got a good anatomical reduction, your outcome is much better than if it's poorly reduced. And they found treatment with just a plastic cast wasn't uh, good and closed reduction and internal fixation achieved up to 53% good outcome. So what's the evidence uh, for treatment? Chris Kotze uh, did a randomized study looking at purely ligamentous injuries, and he compared primary fusion with fixation, and he found fusion results were better. Subsequently, other authors have found the opposite, that ORIF was better. And then when you look at uh, further series, no difference between fusion and ORIF. Um, Meta-analysis were done uh, subsequently in 2012 and 2016. The one by Chris Kotze found fusion had slight advantage, whereas other systematic reviews and the more recent ones showed there's no difference between primary fusion and ORIF. Uh, what they did find in the ORIF group was a higher need to remove metalwork. And in fact, most surgeons probably remove metalwork at the three to six month stage anyway. So my practice is to reduce uh, anatomically and, and um, fix, not to fuse initially. So outcomes obviously are going to be poor if you've got a severe crush, high energy injury, lots of comminution, Pure ligamentous injuries also, uh, studies show do poorly, end up with a higher need for fusion. And if you've got a non-anatomical reduction, which we've mentioned. Timing is all important. We've seen it in calcaneal fractures and in the talus fractures that you will get significant swelling, blisters. You may have to um, do a temporary fixation and then come back later when the swelling is uh, better. Don't forget compartment syndrome. We haven't touched on that. Uh, greatly, but uh, be vigilant. If you do get compartment syndrome, the management is a little contentious. The complication is you may just end up with clawing of the toes, so what, but sometimes patients have a tense hematoma, severe pain, and not responding to opioids. You have to decompress, take the hematoma, and the pain settles very quickly. You may prevent painful paresthesia as well. So treatment, if patients got a undisplaced fracture you deemed is stable, then you can treat it with a non-weight bearing plaster for six weeks. I would advocate you getting um, interval x-rays just to make sure it doesn't redisplace. Studies do show there's a high incidence of redisplacement. If it's displaced and it's obviously open, lots of soft tissue compromise, then you may have to um, do what Raja said, span, scan and plan. So fixator across, let the soft tissue heal, and then come back when the soft tissues, uh, when the soft tissue allows. So if it's displaced, closed injury, and it's settled open where you've put your fixator on, then you look at anatomical reduction um, of the foot, and you can use a variety of techniques, ranging from plates, screws, tight ropes, even continue with an external fixator if necessary. So primary fusion we touched upon before, it has been advocated in the past, and certainly for pure ligamentous injuries, that may be uh, uh, an option. And uh, Chris Kotze's series tends to balance in favor of fusion, whereas systematic meta-analysis suggests ORIF is just as good. So post-operatively, once you've done your fixation, uh, you keep the non weight bearing in a plastic cast, and then in the walker boot, they may need orthotics temporarily, but uh, look out for CRPS. So the learning point here is really soft tissue, soft tissue and soft tissue. Know the fracture, planning is important and correct operation. Um, you must get anatomical reduction. Restore the column lengths, 
stable fixation, you need good rehabilitation. And see what, these are some of the complications which you'll see, and you'll see these complications in many other fractures, such as infection, nerve damage, vascular compromise. We saw that in Liz Frank's original series of midfoot amputation. You can get non-union metalwork that becomes a problem that needs removing. There was a study looking at Liz Frank injuries treated at 10 years, and they found up to three quarters of the patients had radiological signs of osteoarthritis, but functionally they had returned to the previous occupation. So here's a case in point. So this is the one we showed before. So don't forget, look carefully um, at the x-rays. You can see the first TMT joint sublux, base of second metatarsal is fractured, third metatarsal is fractured, and the cuboid is also crushed. CT scan may help with the planning. Intraoperatively, you can see uh, fracture fragments all over the place. You need to reduce this anatomically. So if the soft tissue doesn't allow, then reduce anatomically, stabilize with the K wire, and then come back. Stay, K wires alone are probably not sufficient. You have to remove them often at six to eight weeks because uh, of pin track problems. Ligaments take three months. And this is the cuboid element. You've got to restore the lateral column. And then this was the definitive fixation where uh, intra-articular fractures were fixed. You had a bridging plate crossing the joint and a cuboid H-plate maintaining the length. There are other techniques. Tight ropes, this is for a pure uh, first, second uh, joint diastasis. It was a closed uh, injury, closed reduction, closed fixation. There's a variety of other techniques also, and KYs tend to be used for the lateral column to maintain mobility. Screws have been used in the past, but they tend to use up 6% of the joint space. So if you take away a bit of the joint space, chances are you may precipitate or promote osteoarthritis. So in conclusion, these are difficult fracture patterns. They can be a cause of major disability and even litigation. So do respect the soft tissue. Try and maintain anatomical reduction. Um, if symptoms occur following treatment, then fusion is always a possibility. So GERF, get it right first time, it should be the principle. Um, revision surgery generally has a poorer outcome if you miss these in the first place, but uh, the actual data is a little variable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nilesh. Uh, very clear message, um, really useful for trainees as well as everyone, I think. Um, and there are lots of questions which have come in the uh, chat room. So Sunil uh, Bajaj, my colleague moderator, is handling the chat room. Sunil, are you ready with the questions yeah, for I'm the faculty? Okay. I'm, I'm okay, Manish, yeah. Okay, okay so we can, we can go with the questions. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, fantastic talks. Uh, uh, there are lots of questions there. First, Dave, uh, uh, it's, uh, the first question is on calcaneal fractures to you. Uh, I think your, 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 your sort of talk is intrigued given the upper limb surgeon. So I've got a question from Sunil Garga, shoulder surgeon who's asking you that uh, he needs a bit of more clarity on the indications of calcaneal fracture fixations. He says that if someone 75 years old, just because he's fit and well, would you go and fix the calcaneum? I guess he's trying to hint, is there an age limit at all? And also the second question, I'll finish his questions. He says that if you are going to do a salvage surgery, like a calcaneal fracture mal union, where you're due to an osteotomy, what are the results of a salvage of a badly mal united calcaneal fracture salvage surgery? All right, Dave, to you. I have a feeling that uh, Dave Mahadevan has been, oh yeah, <laughs> he's just joining again. I think it's a glitch with the computer. While Dave is joining, uh, can you get uh, questions for Rajesh and Nilesh? Okay, so let's start Rajesh then. Okay, so Rajesh, uh, uh, so the, I think one of your case illustration is uh, actually may have answered this question, but uh, it's regarding uh, uh, there's a, Mr. Walil uh, has asked that if you have a displaced Taylor neck fracture where the body is extruded out and it's endangering the skin, and would you take him straight to the uh, operation theater in the middle of the night 
And if you do take him to theater, and if you're not able to reduce it close, then he being a non foot and ankle surgeon, how uh, does he have to open it? And what approach has he to do there? Okay, very good question. Uh, the exact same question comes in real life as well as in the exam. So the default answer is yes, you would seek help, you would beg, borrow for, from a foot and ankle surgeon to come and help you. If you're lucky, they would come and do it for you. But if you're unlucky, as generally is in the exam, they will tell you, no, you are the only person available. So my uh, answer to you is you cannot leave the skin un in threat. If the tailor body is extruded, then you don't have a choice. And that's why it's very important to, whenever you get a chance, either cadaveric or in real life, practice those anteromedial and anterolateral approaches. If you're non put an ankle surgeon and you are stuck in this situation, even in the middle of the night, the least I can expect you as a colleague is to reduce that tailor body back. I would prefer you to just reduce the tailor body back and not fix it because you should not compromise my definitive fixation. As long as you've reduced the tailor body back, then I'm happy to come in next day or the day after and fix them once the soft tissue settled. So it's important to reduce that skin threat. Very, very important. And the trick to that is to use anterolateral and anteromedial approaches. You should use a calcaneal pin to give traction and then lever the tailor body back. You can use a McDonald's or a periosteal elevator to gently, gently get that tailor body back into the tibia tailor joint. As soon as you've done that, you can close and let me come in next day and fix them for you. Okay, Rajesh has an extension. If there was no skin compromise, if the skin was not in excessive tension, for the vascularity point of view, is there an evidence that if you do a delayed reduction, it, have, it, it has a higher risk of AVN? Unfortunately, there's no uh, evidence that I know of about the vascularity. But in general, if it is out of place, there's no skin around the ankle, no soft tissue mass. So if it, the tibio-tailor joint is dislocated, the skin will be compromised because there's no spare la skin laxity in that area. Okay. The other question so, is from Rahul Singh. And he says, what is the biological mechanism of the Hawkins sign? Because it's such an important prognostic sign. So what is the biological mechanism? Why do you get the Hawkins sign? It, it just shows with disuse osteoporosis, the whole limb gets osteoporosis. So in tailless fractures, if you get that osteoporotic sign on the tailor dome, that means the tailless body has blood supply and that part of the body is also being involved in that disuse osteoporosis type of picture. But at six to eight weeks, if the rest of the foot and ankle is showing osteopenia, but the tailor body is white and sclerotic, that means that's not good news. So Dave, are you back? Are we okay for good starting with the calcaneal fracture questions? Thanks, Rajesh. Is Dave back? Yeah, he is back. I can see him. Uh, he needs to unmute. Dave, can you? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Dave. Are you there? I think he's got some connection problems. Okay. Why don't you carry on with uh, yeah. Liz Frank? Yeah. Okay. Um, Manish, uh, um, if, if you want, I can answer Dev's question, and Dev can join in. Well. I, I, I sure. think there's no, there's no phys physiological age for calcaneal fractures. Some 60-year-olds I see are very good athletes, they'll run. So providing the bone quality is good. And they don't have risk factors, they're not a smoker, uh, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, then I would still fix them. And it's, I think it's a discussion with the patient. If you've got a displaced fracture, that you can re restore anatomy, it actually helps for future. Uh, care. If they develop uh, joint changes, then fusion is much, much easier, I find. Again, you need to weigh up the risk. The evidence uh, probably goes against you, so you do need to have uh, some insight into what the patient's expectations are. Um, yeah, I would completely of... agree with Nilesh about this. If physiologically it demands surgery, then I would fix them, uh, because it is very difficult to salvage and do distraction or uh, fusion of the subtalar joint at a later stage. The trick I use is I do inform the patient about the UK heel trial, but also discuss with one of my other foot and ankle colleagues so that I've got shared a sort of clinical governance type of picture that would they agree that this patient would justify surgery and document that. 
Yeah. And I, I think an extension to this question, Vish Kumar has asked that if you had bilateral calcaneal fractures, uh, Saunders, say, 3 BC, and would you do simultaneous fixation or would you stage it? I, I, I think I would do it simultaneous if, it was, if the decision was to fix it. The question is then how would you approach it? Would you have the patient on the lateral side and then flip him over? Um, some surgeons in Stoke, our trauma centre, would do them prone. So that gives you access to both sides. You might have a team of surgeons doing both sides. But yes, Sunil, no, Sunil yeah. I'm, I'm really sorry to intervene. See, my, my question as an upper limb surgeon is, is that we have a, a similar dilemma for proximal humerus fractures, but in proximal humerus fractures, we certainly have a lot of, uh, uh, lots of case series, and some of the RCTs even say that fixation is actually can have better outcomes. But in, in calcaneal fractures, we are unable to find any studies which, which can categorically say emphatically that yes, by fixation, you're actually improving outcomes or making, making life easier for, for the surgeon for future surgery. So in lack of that, with, with, with respect to lack of evidence, how difficult is it to convince? Because I work in a district general hospital. I don't have a, I don't have luxury of many foot and ankle surgeons around me. So if I was to offer surgery, I'll have to refer them to a tertiary center. And that's why this question is relevant for my practice. No, no uh, Sunil, the point is that, see, mm -hmm. now with calcaneal fractures, the problem is the mal united calcaneal fractures, are, as you yourself know, are quite difficult to treat. So we are, although you may not restore the articular surface congruity, but as the speakers have said, you need to get, gain the height, you need to gain, correct the varus, you need to reduce the width, because the worst scenario is having a malunited calcaneal fracture when you have to do a subsequent fusion. That is a complete dilemma and it's a complete, it's a complete of going into hell. So if you could improve it so that you can have a basis or a foundation to fuse it in the future, so you should do something to do that, rather than leave it in a malunited position and then come back later and deal with two disasters. That's what I think. I don't know if Nilesh or Rajesh or Manish want to add in. I, I, I so Nil, say, all I'll say, mm, sorry, Nil, I, I, I was I just, just making a light comment that Sunil mm. Garg has ignited Sunil Bajaj's passion. <laughs> but Nilesh, please carry on. Yeah. No, I, I would say um, if you go back to the UK heel fracture trial, the study itself excluded those fractures you would fix. So those fractures where it was highly, highly displaced uh, subfibril impingement. Um, you would go ahead and fix it. Those which were minimally displaced, which were randomized. So it actually was very selective. Of a right. thousand patients, only a hundred, two hundred were randomized. They haven't looked at the newer modern techniques, which they've mentioned, minimally invasive surgery. So we don't know what the outcomes of those are relative to the historical study. So I, I, I see patients, you, you fix ankle uh, calcaneal fractures, and you do see better outcomes uh, anecdotally. I don't have um, published evidence, but if you speak to foot and ankle surgeons, you, you will you will see a similar pattern of treatment. Especially I was I was going to say I was just going to say exactly same that uh, Sunil uh, Garg that there is a bias you can see, and the bias is because we foot and ankle surgeons do see a lot of malunited fractures, and that is a problem. When you ha are faced with malunited fractures, then it becomes really difficult. You know. Uh, it, 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 it becomes sometimes impossible to actually reduce it, get the height back and things like that. So all of us therefore feel that if it is a significantly displaced fracture in a physiologically okay patient, then I think you should consider fixation until unless, as Dev was mentioning, if it is bag of bones where you can't do anything and the outcome is poor, definitely, as Dev touch base, then that's a different issue. Or if you know that the patient is like that, he's uh, drinking three bottles of vodka, unreliable um, and, and, and smoking and all that, and then you're going to put them at risk. But otherwise, you should consider surgery. That's the message, I think, from this forum. Okay, Good then, then, thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah. Next is for Liz Frank, sir, it's for Nilesh. Yeah. So Nilesh, it's uh, from Siva Srikanda, who says, uh, uh, would you advocate removal? So if you're doing a joint sparing approach where you put plates in, would you advocate a routine removal of these plates? No, no, I, I tend to leave my metal work in. Um, I protect patients six weeks in a plaster, six weeks, four to six weeks in a boot. They can walk and then they walk in soft trainers. Um, if the metal work causes a problem, then I would electively remove it, but minimum three to four months before I would even consider that. But so, then, really? 
sorry you okay manish you want to go yeah. no i was just going to say nilesh uh, the problem is that uh, the metal work breaks and <laughs> the problem is that when you are considering further surgery then it's going to come in the way and then it becomes more difficult so i agree with your point but i i i edge towards removing the metal i if, if especially a uh, young patient i i do tend to remove the metal after 6 months just because it's going to break uh, and yeah. then it's going to be difficult i yeah. take a slightly yeah. different approach what i do for all this frank's injuries is if i'm using bridge plating i see they are opposite side if they've got any movements more than 5 to 10 degrees of dorsiflexion plantar flexion at the tmt joints i tend to remove those metal works otherwise my default position is to leave them in situ yeah i would agree i've not had cause to go back um, to remove broken metal work i yeah. would also uh, echo the same manish i mean i haven't had any this thing to go back but i know you did mention about breakage of implants one more thing a nilicious if you have a delayed or neglected list franks what would be your cut off time after which would you consider a primary fusion uh, versus open reduction internal fixation how uh, how late would you still venture into orif yeah i i i think some of the data it's historic but hard castle published data showing that if you um fix list frank injuries up to 6 weeks then the outcome is good after 6 weeks you might as well fuse it yeah i agree i i agree i i i fixed up to 6 weeks and and yes after that I, i i i fuse as well okay we have a question from sorry so, uh, sorry sunil uh can we ask the faculty all uh, all of us are primary fixers or fuse does anybody fuse uh list franks primarily primarily no. fixed fix yeah oh, yeah. Fixed, yeah. yeah yeah so there's a concern there's a question from krishna vemulapalli who has asked about open calcaneal fractures you know open calcaneal fracture one of the contraindication for fixation because of the high soft tissue complications so what are the views of the faculty if they had a open calcaneal fracture which was fixable would they still go and fix it or how would they manage that well i i would say um ashka ali um who works at queen elizabeth in birmingham um sees a lot of military high explosion calcaneal fractures so a lot of soft tissue compromise and his uh, management is essentially try to restore anatomy as best you can by using wires you can't obviously put any metal work inside risk of infection is very high so you dev are you back dev are you back <laughs> dev <laughs> So, I mean, I <laughs> you you everything. you were hiding. <laughs> I hope it doesn't break down. I'm using my phone's connection. Nilesh, Nilesh and Rajesh, Nilesh and Rajesh have very kindly um, uh, filled in. But we we would like to know your thoughts as well. So Sunil, can you ask Dev? So one uh, the, 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 and Dev, there was a first indication what Sunil was talking about, Mr. Sunil Garg. So he was saying, you know, that you know, all the, as there is no hard evidence. that fixation actually you know has good results compared to non operative fixation so even if you had a 75 year old if he was fit and well uh, even those have, uh, you know ha- quite high age would you still go and fix it considering that there is no hard evidence that fixation is actually better than non operative yeah i i think each patient has to be looked as uh, as a as a patient as an individual really because i i wouldn't use age as a cut off by any sense and the way i look at it is i mean i'm not saying i'm an aggressive surgeon that will fix all calcaneal fractures but there are some of them with significant displacement and significant uh deformity that you can almost predict by not intervening this patient is not going to be able to get that foot into a shoe and is not going to be able to walk on it comfortably so the answer to the question is i wouldn't use age as a cut off by any sense so a fracture uh a scenario where i think i can make a difference in terms of there are certainly lots of contraindications in my books poor soft tissue envelope bad peripheral vascular disease poorly controlled diabetics is a different story but if you're fit and well i wouldn't use age as a cut off okay so one thank, thank you yeah, yes sorry, i was going to ask about open that's coming up in the chat quite often so dev what is your management strategy for open fractures of calcaneum Okay so open fractures are rare. I've seen one and that's the only one I've dealt with and that's uh, because we are not a major trauma center and most 
most of them get referred. But saying that, even if you're in a major trauma center, the incidence of it is low. We know that the prognosis is bad, regardless of what you do to it. But I think the soft tissue protection is important. The wound needs to be debrided. And invariably, in open fractures, these are the more displaced fractures and the ones where if you do not deal with the fracture, your skin is still under uh, tension and that open wound is just probably going to be more compromised. So in a lot of these fractures, well, at least the, the one that I've experienced in it, it's, it's all about just to hold the fracture in a reasonable morphology to allow the soft tissues to settle. And that's probably my primary objective. Thank you, Dev. Dev, I've uh, got one minute. more question for oh, you. Go on, go on. Uh, what is your fixation choice for tongue fractures? Do you do tension man wiring? Do you use cannulated screws? What do you do, Dev? I, I use cannulated screws. Four, four mils or six and a half, depending on the uh, direction of the fracture line. But yeah, cannulated screws is my preferred option. Okay, thank you. Only thing, Mani, there's one more question, Dev, about uh, MIS for calcaneal fracture. So uh, Anoop is asking, are there any uh, sort of tips to achieve your objective? Are there any tools you can use to achieve your objective when you do your MIS approach, or uh, sinus tarsi approach? So uh, I think it's, it's about what you are trying to restore with these fracture patterns. So I do not use one technique for all fractures. I think each, tech, uh, each fracture needs to be treated differently. So for me, as I said in my talk, MIS approaches do not give you, at least in my hands, enough power to correct all deformities because of the visualization and potential for um, you know, the, the deformity correction. However, I think there's a place for it in certain fractures. So the, the articular step-offs, where all you need to do is visualize the articular surface, and you can either do that through a little scope in the sinus tarsi, or using x-rays of the mini C arm, like we talked about the Broden's views, etc. So with the MIS technique, it's all about what am I trying to restore here? If it's a posterior facet depression, then I will make small incisions under the depressed fragment to elevate it. And then you just do strategic incisions based on where or what you're trying to restore. But it is limited. So for me, uh, with the MIS techniques, I'll probably use it in someone who's got relatively bad soft tissue compromise where the fracture is also bad and I can't leave the floor. That's when I, uh, I do the MIS, which is to almost restore the articular surface, restore the hind foot shape to a degree, accepting that it would not be perfect. Thank you. Sunil, have we finished the questions? Yeah, I think we the... have, yes, uh, Manish finished, yeah. Okay, can we just ask uh, two or three questions? I'm going to ask... Uh, Nilesh first. Nilesh, what's your treatment strategy for uh, post-traumatic arthritis of lateral tarsometatarsal joints once you have exhausted the use of steroid injections? What do you do? It is difficult um, because we, we, you have no qualms about using the med middle and medial column. Lateral column you try and maintain as best you can, but I have used them in patients. Um, and actually it takes the pain away and providing you can then accommodate them with decent orthotics and shoes, they do manage well. So I wouldn't say never fuse the uh, fourth or fifth KMT joints. I haven't seen any good evidence that interposition, um, arthroplasty, replacements, ceramics has had any uh, benefit. Um, chylectomy is something uh, you can also use uh, as, as a temporizing measure, but I have fused and Yes, you, you, you can fuse all the way across. Thank you. What about the other speakers? Uh, Rajesh? Uh, I tend not to fuse the fourth, fifth. You do chylectomy. There is description of excision and interposition arthroplasty for the fourth, fifth race. But generally, they are secondary to instability of the first, second, third race. Uh, so I personally haven't fused any fourth, fifth. Sorry, what do you interpose? What do you put in? You can put anything at all. The extension digital on Bravis is what I normally do. Okay. okay. Yes, Krishna. Hi. Please, please hi. join in. Yeah. Yeah. I know that I'm not in the panel, but... No, no, uh, no. Not to worry. Not to worry. You are eminent foot and ankle surgeon. Please. Oh, I don't know about that one, Manish. <laughs> but uh, I agree with uh, uh, what Rajesh is saying. 
uh, a fourth and fifth is a mobile joint. So we should not, uh, I mean, uh, my understanding is that if you fuse that, that is going to cause more problem. So I always do, you know, like what you have said about the steroids, uh, 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 orthosis to offload the lateral side. And then if that, if that doesn't work, uh, I do a small excision arthroplasty uh, using a Midas Rex or something like that. I have about three or four patients who has excellent result and I have been doing that for the last uh, six, seven years. Nobody has come back to me. So sorry, when you say excision arthroplasty, are you excising the base of fourth and fifth metatarsals? Yes, I, I just create a small space between the the, the fourth and fifth TMT joints. Oh, that's interesting one. I've never come across that. Has that been and published, it, Krishna? Well, I have three cases. So I think yeah. uh, if you do some, then we can do a joint publication then. <laughs> and I don't put anything because if you put anything, it is going to disappear over there. Mm -hmm. Manish, no, just to add on, you know, I was with Prof Hinterman and he was actually swearing at someone who had fused the fourth and fifth. He actually had to take it down and he had done an interpersonal arthroplasty. So I, I guess there are evidences, but it's uh, apparently it's, it's not the best with fusing the fourth and fifth. <clears throat> so it's I a think, difficult uh, area and there is no easy it, answer. Yeah. It is a difficult area and if you have excessive loading on the lateral side with fusion, it is more difficult. You are create. You, you are converting a challenging to a impossible situation then. Mm. I've got one more question for Nilesh. Mm. Uh, Nilesh, one of uh, your pictures showed tightrope and I'm interested in that because the reason is I had a, an elite player and the physiotherapist uh, or this team doctor wanted me to use tightrope and I said, I'm not going to use tightrope, I'll fix it the way I do it. So how is your experience with type, uh, titro for uh, soft, uh, ligamentous injuries for Le uh, Les Frank? Uh, I have not used it. I have seen it used. I tend to use a inert screw either from the medial cuneiform to the second metatarsal or vice versa, depending on your exposure. But my concern with the tightrope is you, you do get a um, the fiber wire has poly surrounding it and you will get irritation, uh, sometimes inflammation in that zone. So my personally, I, I don't use it personally, but I, I am aware of people do use it with good results. So uh, it was the completion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rajesh and Dev, do you have any experience of tightrope for Liz Frank or Sunil? Uh, I've done the Arthrex tightrope twice, only in uh, this just athletic population. My default is screws, but I've used it twice. Arthrex do have a very nice mini tightrope configuration. One goes through the Liz Franks area from second metatarsal base to the medial cuneiform. And they've also got an intercuneiform type of tightrope. And it does work only in a very extensive experience of two cases. <laughs> I've used actually uh, the Liz Frank plate of Arthrex. I've used it two or three times. That's a very nice plate. Has anybody used Liz Frank plate? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's a very, and it's quite robust as well. I, I thought that you don't need to remove that plate afterwards. It, it, it doesn't break. So, yes. good. Uh, so Manish, uh, I was seeing evidence and, you know, the adolescent list franks, you know, where you have an adolescent list franks, which is ligamentous, they yeah. do indicate the use of the mini tightrope. But I think in the adult list franks, as you said, just stabilizing them probably would restore the stability, you know, as you did. Excellent. Uh, one question to Rajesh. Uh, Rajesh, I mean, a lot has been talked about in the literature about uh, of uh, AVN following Taylor's fractures. Now, in real life, how much does AVN matter? I mean, if 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 you have protected the uh, bone uh, when you identify that that's going to be AVN and there is no significant collapse of Taylor's, then does AVN really matter? See, this Hawkins classification is extremely extremely old now. And uh, later on publications, some of them, very few publications have said that the AVN rate is lower. But yes, I do have a few set of patients with severe AVN of the Taylor Dome, which are very difficult to treat because you end up needing to do either a tibio talocalcaneal fusion. And that too is very, very unsuccessful, a high rate of non-unions in them. So it is best avoided, but if you have one, then Fusion seems to be the best alternative for them. And there is a series from Paul Cook, isn't it? Uh, that uh, arthroscopic ankle fusion there was, I think, out of 1917 uh, healed. 
uh, yeah. by doing arthroscopic ankle fusion. But my question really was, are they symptomatic? Uh, just, Most just, of just them are not. Yeah, exactly. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm. Uh, guys, we had a fantastic session. We have spent uh, well over 20 minutes um, post 12 o'clock. Uh, and, and, and I think most of the uh, people have stayed on, which actually shows that uh, it's really important, these, these, uh, these scenarios which we have picked up, high energy trauma for foot and ankle, all these topics, uh, they come up in exams and in real life as well. And uh, thank you so much to the three speakers, uh, Dev, Rajesh and Nilesh, who have given their precious time on a Sunday to, to be with us and we have really, really benefited. So on behalf of BIOS, I would like to thank you all. And uh, thanks very much for tuning in, joining in uh, for this webinar. And your questions obviously made the discussion more interactive. Thank you for my co-chair, Mr. Bajaj, um, for his excellent moderation. Uh, and uh, I hope you enjoy most of the remaining Sunday. Thank you so much. We'll meet you, you. on thank our next you. webinar. Thank you. thank you for inviting Manish. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Bios. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye, Thank bye. You.